For more than 2,000 years, India was the sole supplier of gemstones to the world. Golconda diamonds, sapphires from Kos Homer, and pearls from the Gulf of Manne, were coveted, and drew merchants across land and sea to India. For the rulers, jewels were a statement of power, prosperity, and prestige. But for Indian women, jewellery was, and is, in many parts considered a social and economic security, the value of which will almost always appreciate, never depreciate. At that time, India was the largest manufacturer and exporter of beads to the world. India was also home to the diamond and invented the diamond drill, which was then taught to the Romans. The craftsmen of the Indus Valley civilization used semi-precious material like carnelian, agate, turquoise, faience, steatite, and feldspar, fashioning them into tubular or barrel shapes, decorating them with carvings, bands, dots, and patterns, or setting them minutely with gold. Going by the jewelry they made and wore, the ancient people of the Indus Valley civilization were an extremely sophisticated lot, with a finely developed aesthetic sense, backed by intricate engineering skills. Take for instance, the necklace excavated from Mohenjo-daro, now on display at the Jewelry Gallery of the National Museum in Delhi. The sheet gold forehead ornament, for instance, is of a shape that you will find women still wearing in different parts of India. The Rajasthani Borla is a close approximation, as is the ornament that Didargunjay Yakshi, one of the finest examples of ancient Indian sculpture, wears prominently in the middle of her forehead. Yet despite the relative simplicity of these early pieces, Indian jewellery was about to become much more complex in its style and workmanship. In the 2000 years after the decline of Mohenjo-daro, the Indian craftsman had polished his skills immensely. So there's delicate filigree work on gold, embossing work, and detailed microgranulations on the pendants, of a pair of large earrings that date back to this period. While Sila Padakaram, an ancient Tamil classic of the Sangam era, talks of a society dealing in gold, pearls, and precious stones, the Chronicles of Pace, a Portuguese traveler, describes the dazzling jewellery worn by the people of the Vijayanagar Empire. The Kundan method of setting stones in pure gold, was also perfected by artisans in the Mughal period. Here, the gold used for jewellery was fused at room temperature. Another technique that was developed by the Mughals was the inlaying of stones with gold. The repetitive color palette of green, red, and white in Mughal designs, corresponds to the intensive use of emeralds, rubies, and diamonds. As much as these gems were a symbol of the opulence and dignity of the empire, they were also treasured as protective talismans. Emeralds were enormously popular with the Mughal court, whose emperors referred to them as Tears of the Moon. One of the most treasured jewels in Indian history, the Taj Mahal Emerald, is an exquisite hexagonal emerald, intricately carved with stylized flowers, that mirror the decor of the Taj Mahal. The Asaf Jahinizams of Hyderabad were also famed for their legendary jewels. The last Nizam, Mir Osman Ali Khan, once called the richest man in the world by the Time magazine, had an unbelievable collection of jewels. He gifted, the stunning Nizam of Hyderabad diamond necklace, to Queen Elizabeth II, when she married Prince Philip. The Rockefeller Sapphire, a Burmese blue sapphire of 62.02 carats, also belonged to the Nizam of Hyderabad, before it was acquired by John D. Rockefeller in 1934. Then there is the Jacob Diamond, the enormous diamond that was apparently used as a paperweight, by Mir Osman Ali Khan, after he found it inside his father's slipper. Also among the Nizam's jewels are fabulous head decorations, known as agret or sarpek, from the word sar for head and pek for screw. Veritably dripping, with fine gemstone drops, the sarpek was worn by the Nizam's as a turban ornament. Just one of these, contained more gemstones, than most people could afford to acquire, in an entire lifetime. Other remarkable pieces in the Nizam's collection, include a seven-strand pearl necklace, known as Satlata, meaning seven strings, which contains approximately 465 Basra pearls. The pearls are from the city of Basra, in modern-day Iraq. Pearls from this region have been treasured for hundreds of years, for their perfectly spherical shape, silvery-white color, and beautiful iridescence. There is also the Pazabe, 
anklets made from hinged gold panels, studded with gemstones, that were worn by the women of the royal court of the Nizams. Cross-cultural influence, worked the other way too, Cartier's famous Tutti Frutti style, was based on the floral motifs, of South Indian jewellery, complete with sapphires, emeralds and rubies. The story of Indian jewellery, is incomplete without a mention of two of the most famous gems in the world, the Kohinoor, and the Hope Diamond. Entrenched in history, having been passed down, by some of the greatest rulers of massive empires, in the Indian subcontinent, the Kohinoor is a priceless diamond the size of a ping-pong ball. According to legends, in the 13th century, the diamond was found in Guntur, in Andhra Pradesh. Currently housed in the Tower of London in the United Kingdom, the diamond's ownership has been much disputed by four countries, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Britain. One of the most spectacular gems in the world, the Hope Diamond, is a lustrous blue gem, weighing 45.52 carats. The largest blue diamond in the world, the gem is rumored to be a cursed stone, that brings ill luck to its owner. The stone was discovered in India, and is believed to have been plucked, from a sculpted statue of a goddess in a temple. In 1668, King Louis XIV of France, bought it from a French traveler, before recutting it several times to the gem, that today adorns a chain of 45 white diamonds, surrounded by 16 alternating, pear-shaped, and cushion-cut white diamonds. Tarakashi This unique art form, developed in the late 1500s in Orissa, and is a modified version of Greek filigree work. It displays, a unique combination of utility, as well as beauty, and is inspired from nature. Most Tarakashi designs feature, intricate elements of flora and fauna, in fine silver wire. Customarily, a charka was used, to swirl out brooches, necklaces, hoops, and pendants. But now, even Tarakashi rings, toe rings, anklets, and hairpins are becoming highly popular, because of their exclusive antiquated design. Thiwa Dating back to the 16th century, the Thiwa art of making jewelry, is still very popular, in parts of Rajasthan, and Gujarat. Infusing the audacious luster of 23 karat gold, with festive vibrant beads, this design was first made by, a Protopgaria goldsmith, Nadulal Sonival. Soon after, it caught the eye of Maharaja Sumant Singh, during whose reign, this art form flourished. Pachchakam Origination from the Kutch of Gujarat, this art form derives its name, from a Gujarati word Pachchigar, meaning a goldsmith. Pachchakam jewelry, is made using soft shimmery metals, preferably platinum, or silver. Usually, glass beads and semi-precious metals add color, to Pachchakam rings, bangles, anklets, trinkets, yahumkis and pendants. Meenakari Introduced by Raja Monsing, this artistic jewelry form, uses enameling, to amp up the aesthetic coefficient of the ornament. Typically, this art form is fairly laborious, and is usually kept on lac sticks, while the designs are etched on it. Later, suitable colored enamel dust, is poured into these grooves, and then heated, until the dust liquefies, and travels all around the groove. Then, the prepared design, is set in silver or gold, to complete the adornment. Meenakari work of Bikaner, Rajasthan, Varanasi, Oatar Pradesh, Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh, and Kolkata, is highly popular all over the world. Nadhadwara's silver Meena work, looks exquisite, and is very popular, amongst the young fashionistas. Kundamkari Incorporating the extravagance of diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and other gemstones, this form of art originated in the Rajasthani, and Gujarati royal courts in the early 19th century. Kundan's charm, and unique claw setting, are definitely hard to miss. Also, stone-encrusted Kundamkari jewels, are often lined with, vividly colorful Meena. Kundan wristlets, necklaces, earrings, and anklets, are even today, used by modern fashion-conscious brides. Yadao Combining the elegance of Meenakari work, and the extravagance of Kundamkari, 
this form of studded jewelry, looks to be lifted out directly, from the Mughal era. This setting technique uses uncut diamond pole kiss, and semi-precious stones, as embellishments. Usually, gold or silver foil, is wrapped around the polki, to make it more glistening, while a lac framework is prepared, by the garyas. Then, the polki is pushed, and set into the lac structure, which is then finished, by using gold. Also, colorful semi-precious, and precious stones, are studded in Yadao jewels, to make them ready for the brides. Victorian Influenced by the European-style jewels, brought and adorned by the British invaders, the Victorian-style jewels are made using gold, platinum or silver and decorated with, inexpensive garnets, corals, and other commonly available materials. These articles, usually bear an inimitable Anglo-Indian charm, which has made them highly popular, among the Generation Y inexpensive Victorian brooches, bracelets and hair adornments, are used by Indian girls even today. To preserve the unique rustic charm of vintage jewelry, it is essential, to take proper care of it. For instance, extensive exposure to dust, sunlight or rain, can make the jewel lose its earthy lure. Similarly, rough handling, or vigorous scrubbing, brushing or washing, can instantly damage it and take away its relic appeal. Therefore, it is important, to store all jewelry items safely, in anhydrous conditions. Remember the phrase, the older the better, when purchasing antique jewels and collectibles.